Welcome everyone to the special episode of the Native American Wars podcast. My name is Greg Franklin. I'd like to introduce you to my co-host Mike Ramsey Hello. and our recording engineer Fritz Beer. Hello. This is a truly special episode of Native American Wars podcast because we haven't actually launched yet. We thought that since it was getting clo close to Thanksgiving, that what a better way to introduce ourselves and the podcast than by putting out an episode about the story of the first Thanksgiving. Oh, classic, classic Indian story. Mm -hmm. Let's play Indian legends. Uh, and, and, and the pilgrims, too. So. Yeah. Next mm -hmm. week, we'll, uh, we'll release our first actual episode dealing with contact with the Norse. Okay, a little bit about the pilgrims. In 1608, a group of Protestant separatists moved from the village of Scrooby in Nottinghamshire. <laughs> really, I, knew, I knew you guys were going to have to chuckle at that. Well, they moved from Scrooby to Leiden, which is in Holland. And uh, these people, we know them as, as pilgrims, but they called themselves saints. And everyone else, they called strangers. They rejected the Church of England and... They were starting to get into some hot water in Scrooby, so they decided to move to Leiden mm. in Holland, which is, uh, at the time, was more of a uh, secular uh, area, and they thought they could worship more as they w wanted to. However, in Leiden, they found that uh, while a lot of them were skilled tradesmen and, and everything, they found out that immigrants weren't allowed to join the guilds, so they were they had to take more menial, less well-paying jobs, oh, and so mm -hmm. things weren't a easy. Bit of discrimination. I, why they why they could worship as they wanted, they worshipped at worshipped as they wanted, very poor. Very poorly. <laughs> and so they and poorly, they poor. also one thing that they found out was uh, that Holland was such a uh, secular government and everything that a lot of the younger people started uh, being led astray by the modern world and the pilgrims had never really encountered this. They had led a pretty sheltered existence up until they got to Leiden. To remedy this situation, they decided to move to the New World. So, okay, so they found uh, that it was, like, Holland was, was uh, was risque and mysterious was, even back then. Right, uh, from what, yeah. I, I'm not yeah. sure, I'm not sure how much uh, hash they were smoking. Did they have hash back then? Yeah. But they had the blue light district or red light district? Well, no, I, I don't think they had any, well, maybe they did, but, I mean, there's always been red light districts, right? But, okay. but I mean, they, I think, I think from, from, from my reading, they just didn't like, they just generally didn't like the Dutch they felt like they were a bad influence on on them, and they they weren't Dutch people, they were Englishmen, and they really liked the fact that they were Englishmen, but they but they really felt that they'd been uh, betrayed by the, uh, the powers that be in England who had established the Church of England. I don't know if you know this or not, but in Elizabethan times, you were required to go to the Anglican Church on Sunday, and if you didn't go, you were fined. Like William Brewster, who they the English went to the Netherlands to grab the, to put the gravis on him, and he escaped and everything. But he carried a fine from not going to church on sun, on oh, Sunday yeah, because right. he was they were doing their own church, they, right. not the Anglican one. Well, I, went, I went to the Catholic church. Uh, I, I go to the Catholic church. I went, to, I went to a couple Sundays ago, and I got fined. <laughs> <laughs> I went to church and got fined. Well, I don't know. They set the basket down, and I and I was guilted into. It's not. It's not. That's not, that's not a fine. That's a that, that ensures that your immortal soul is safe. Oh, okay. Anyway, right, William. Right. Any well. Anyway, William Bradford said that a lot of the younger members were being drawn away by evil examples into extravagances and dangerous courses. Ooh. Reminds so, me of college. Anyway. <laughs> so, Mike. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what happened when they decided to go to the New World? Okay. Um, well, the uh, the main the main question that you might want to ask yourself is, okay, you got a bunch of congregants, right? These 40, 41 folks who are members of this Puritan congregation, and suddenly they want to you know go to the New World. How how are they going to do that? Right. What is the first thing you always have to think about? How are you going to pay for this, right? 
So they had to start thinking to themselves, how you know they've got they've got a, a, a group of people that have relocated to the Netherlands and they can't have great jobs. All they can do is manual labor. How are they going to afford a boat, right? A big boat, much less cannon, armor, food, beverages, all this kind of stuff. Plus gambling. They, did they get? Did they maybe gamble? They actually. William Brewster went down on the track. <laughs> he got a great tip. No, seriously. But but anyway, around the same period of time in England, there there had been much exploration of the New World. In fact, there was already a colony there in Virginia. The Jamestown colony was planted, I think, in 1607. Right. So uh, so there's there are people in England with money, with extra cash, almost like you know what you call the um, investment capitalists that we have today. You know these funds that are put together to invest things that, that they believe are going to become profitable. And this particular group of uh, investors was looking for people to go and colonize someplace because they didn't want to colonize because they were happy in their houses. And, you know. mm-hmm. Comfortable. Right, comfortable. So, so anyway, they were always on the lookout for people to go over and try and exploit the new world. And this group was called the Merchant Adventurers. So anyway, they hook up with the pilgrims, and I don't know how this happens specifically, but, but the, uh, the financing is arranged, and uh, the idea is that the merchant adventurers are going to finance the boat and all the materials to go to the New World. And in, and in, in repayment of that, the settlers are going to pay back a sum of money over a period of time after they get to the New World and establish a colony. And it's very, this is a very dangerous undertaking and risky for the merchant adventurers. Earlier on... I think in 1607 or 1608, they tried to finance another colony on the coast of Maine that failed miserably in the first year for a variety of reasons. But what we have here is we have a, a cohesive group of congregants that were all believed in the same thing and wanted to get out of there. So they yeah, so this this group was appealing because of their of the way they were together, right? And how because they had a lot of stick to it, and they yeah. were like a, they were like their own little sure. unit. Yeah. So so anyway. <laughs> So they, okay. they, they build, they, they commission two ships, one called the Speedwell and one called the, Mayf- called the Mayflower, which we've all heard of the Mayflower, but the first one was called the Speedwell. And they provision it, load it all up, and they head over to England because there's a few other people in England that they got to pick up to take across. So they go back to, I believe they went back to Scrooby. Did they go back to no, Scrooby? I went to Plymouth. Then. Southampton. Okay. So anyway, at Southampton, they, they um, I just like to say Scrooby. So they went back to Southampton and they picked up like, like you know, William, William Brewster, I said they had a warrant for his arrest. He'd been hiding out in Southampton. So they pick him up and they pick up some other folks and they load up. They've got a team. Yes. Now, um, now they're in Southampton. They load up uh, this, this other crew. So they've got all their own people, the, the saints, and uh, they load up this other crew. And this other crew, a lot of them are handpicked by the merchant adventurers as sort of a hedge because they didn't really think that these guys would be able to just go into the new world and survive by themselves. So they, they handpick a bunch of different specialists to go over there with them. Like one of the most important ones that they picked is a guy named Miles Standish. And he is a, he's a, 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 a veteran of the 30 years war. Yeah, he's a veteran of the 30 years war. I'm not sure exactly how much military experience he really had, but he was a trained uh, military dude. And he was going to be in charge of the military uh, part of the of the uh, adventure. So when, when they got on, when they when they hit the new world, he was going to take over the the militia and protection of the colony. So they also brought a bunch. They brought a bunch of weapons, which we'll talk about. And can, they brought some cannon with them, and uh, you know, there's a bunch of indentured servants that came over with them. And then that would the there were indentured servants for the for the saints and there are also a set of indentured servants that served the, the, the merchant adventurers people for the strangers so so they load all these people up take a head count and we come up we come up including the crew like five or six crew members we come up with 102 folks right uh, wait I'm getting ahead of myself I think they had, they might have had a few more than this because they took they initially took the uh, both of the boats out the Mayflower the Mayflower and the Speedwell they took them out of Southampton, and they sailed out for a very short period of time. And it turns out that the Speedwell had some significant defects in its masting and such, and so it basically fell apart. And so they had to all come back, <clears throat> and um, 
consolidated all the, uh, the passengers and everything. And I believe we're, we end up with a hundred and yeah, it's 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. 102 people jump on the Mayflower, <laughs> Mayflower, and head out. Now, remember, before we had two ships, and we had these two ships, and when the two ships left, they only had 120 people manifested to go. So now we've got instead of like maybe a you know relatively even distribution, uh, you know, 60 and 60 or something like that, we've got 102 crammed onto one boat. Right? So that's a lot of people. So the Mayflower goes and takes off and heads for uh, the New World. Um, they left on September, I believe it was September 6th. September 6th, 1620, they left. The voyage took them 66 days. Uh, it was apparently quite miserable, according to the accounts. <laughs> Not nearly as miserable as things were going to get. Well, they left, in, they left in September, so they went right in the middle of hurricane season, too. Right, they left in a bad time for squalls, and plus it's starting to get cold. The North Atlantic is very cold in November, December. So anyway, they, they left, and it took them 66 days. They were, they were a bit storm-tossed. They, they, they got off course, and they uh, landed in a place that they weren't supposed to land. Now, let's take a, a step back, and, and I'll, I'll uh, tell everybody that at the very beginning of this, the merchant adventurers and the pilgrims had agreed, and... Uh, obtained <clears throat> as a part of the price of passage uh, a patent from the Virginia Plantation Colony. So they were supposed to be going to the Virginia Plantation area, which was significantly further south than where they wound up. I mean, they saw when they when they 66 days after leaving, they spotted the tip of Cape Cod, Cape Cod Bay, right in that area. So they, that's the land, that, the first land that they spotted. That was on November 9th. So. They looked at the charts, and they actually, because there had been other Europeans charting the coast, they had a map. John Smith, Captain John Smith, had been across there in like 16, 16, 16, 17, and created a, a nice map of the area, the Plymouth Bay, Plymouth Colony area. And so they, they saw that, and they looked at the map, and they said, oh, this is up north. This is not where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be further south. So they, they decide, on November 9th, they decide to head south. So they head south and run into trouble and immediately turn around, sail back to Cape Cod. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. There's some shallow water uh, that they're going to run into between Cape Cod and um, Narragansett Island and uh, right down through those those straits there. But in, in addition, you know, they were just dog tired of being in a boat first. And second, uh, they were running out of stores. Their provisions were running down. The, the trip took them longer than they anticipated. So, so they went up back up to Cape Cod and they parked the boat, right? They anchored it, and uh, they didn't go. They didn't go ashore yet, because there was a disagreement between the the folks. Uh, a lot of them wanted to go to Virginia. Uh, some of them felt like we, they could do anything they wanted. I mean, according to the accounts, there were, were folks there that were sort of like, "Hey, they can't tell us what to do." Massachusetts, you know, the king and England can't tell us what to do. Now we're all the way over here. We can do what we want to do. So the, the, the 41 families, the, the uh, pilgrim families, the separatists, who were sort of, that was the backbone of this colony anyway to begin with, they all got together and William Bradford and uh, some of the other uh, big wigs, uh, including Miles Standish, they all got together. Carver. Yeah. Winslow. Winslow was, Winslow was a big part of that. Anyway, they got together and decided that we had they had to have some... Despite, you know, they didn't have the charter, and there was nobody there waiting for them to establish the law. So they decided to, to create this document that lives on in history. It's the, the compact. The Mayflower Jeez. compact. I keep, I keep thinking about the charter in my head. It's like a charter. But, they, you know, they had a charter for, for Virginia, but they created this thing called the Mayflower, Mayflower Compact. And uh, they sort of sat around and wrote this. It's actually a very short document. Uh, but what they did in the, in this document, the, the, the drafters of this, uh, wrote uh, th that they were going to, in essence, stick together, form a, 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 a government of laws that were just, and everybody, in, everybody that was going to be in the colony, or at least all the, the primary people, the pilgrims, they all had to consent to be governed by this document. So they all had to sign it. So... They went around and showed it to everybody, and they ratified it, and everybody signed it. So now they have now they have the law. 
So they decide to go ahead and do some exploration, uh, which I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave to Greg, I believe. Greg, are you going to talk about the explorations? Yes, I am. All right. Well, there are, there were three scouting expeditions from the uh, from the Mayflower before they actually decided on settling at Plymouth. The first one, they went ashore. It was uh, William Bradford, Miles Stanish, and a few other of the men from the Mayflower. First expedition, basically what happened is they saw six uh, Native Americans farther down the beach with a dog. They went into the woods and they didn't see him again. And they came across a, what they, it, it was kind of, it was a mound. They didn't really know what it was. They thought it might be a burial mound, so of course they dug it up. <laughs> of course. Yeah, makes sense. What so, should we do with it? Let's dig it up. Let's see what's in there. So they, so they dug it up, and lo and behold, they found a bunch of uh, baskets of corn, which they badly needed. So they took this corn and went back to the Mayflower. The second... Uh, Did they leave a note? I owe you a basket of corn? <laughs> I didn't. A mound of corn? <laughs> yeah, they scrawled it on a wall, on a tree with a lot, right below Croatan. <laughs> Anyway, they uh, they went back to the Mayflower. the uh, The second expedition, the same thing happened. Now, they didn't see they didn't see the six natives, but they found another uh, they found another uh, a mound, and they're like, mm, "More corn!" But they dug this one up, and it actually was a grave. It was bones. <laughs> well, it actually, it wasn't bones. It was somebody that hadn't hadn't been gone too long, because there they said that there was still skin on the on the skull and. What was weird was there was blonde. Hair, it was a blonde-haired person, and in the same grave was a child with a bunch of what looked like Native American jewelry. So that was kind of a stra- that's kind yeah. of a little mystery right there. Nobody right? nobody ever really figured out what was going on there. But anyway, so they go back to the Mayflower again. They didn't really find what they were looking for, you know, a good place to stay. The third, the third time they went out, they got into a skirmish. The arrows were shot at them. They, they fired their, their weapons at them, and it lasted several hours. No, apparently no casualties on either side. Eventually the, uh, the Indians took off. So they, they stayed out a couple more days, and eventually they came across uh, this place where we know now was called Patuxet and this is where they eventually built Plymouth. It was an abandoned Indian village and there were bones scattered about. It looked like, you know, your creepy horror film where you go find something that they just left, you know. What it comes down to that we we pretty much think is that uh, the Native Americans were killed by a plague and there was nobody there to bury the body. And uh, so they thought, well, yeah, they look at all these bones, all these, you know, this would be a good place to live. So now we're talking like, this is December in Matachucha. Yeah. Right? So it's getting it's getting a little, little hard to dig things to put po- posts in the ground and actually build shelter and everything. So anyway, they think they think this is probably as about as good as they're going to do for where they're going to live. So they go back to the the Mayflower. Start, deci- they start bringing their luggage over. And I know I don't want to take you and your luggage to the airport. How about that? Huh? What happens when they go back to the Mayflower? Uh, William Bradford finds out that his 23 year old wife fell overboard and drowned. There's still you know a lot of speculation of whether she actually just fell overboard or was in such despair over, you know, the voyage and and being on this ship for 70 days. And, you know, I I've been in Boston in November, and I want to kill myself, too. <laughs> so anyway. the crap in a bucket for 50 days. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we can delete that. Anyway. <clears throat> you know, that's an interesting question, Fritz, but I don't want to go explore it now, but I wonder, I wonder how they did, they had to have privies on there. So maybe it just went into the ocean. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, I, I can see a guy going well, like, ah, whatever. I'm just uh, yeah, we're, 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 this is already stretching too uh, long. Okay, all right. 
Okay, so anyway, they go back to the Mayflower. He finds out that his wife's uh, gone. And, uh, but then it's, you know, they have to sail from where, where they were anchored to Plymouth, which it was a little bit of a journey. And when they finally do get to Plymouth, the actual Mayflower, they have to anchor a mile offshore because it's so shallow. So I don't know what, if they couldn't find a better place in Plymouth or, or what, but they, in the middle of the winter, they're anchored an, a mile offshore, so they have to continually row people and supplies over. And when you get there, apparently you weren't just going up on the sand. You had to jump out and, and, get wet. and w wade in this freezing cold water at the end of December in Massachusetts. So it's no wonder that people got sick and eventually succumbed to what have you. They, you know, they, and they were suffering from scurvy at the time. It was no wonder that 50% of the people died in the first winter. I mean, that's, that's discouraging in and of itself because, you know, your wife dies. It's a terrible thing. And, uh, and it's, it's an awful, well, it's, I guess. I miss my, my first wife could have, and that wouldn't have bugged me too much. But the second one, I would So anyway, the, um, you go on, you know, you, you, think, about it, you, th you think about yeah, it. You think about it. You think about it. This is a bad winter, right? This is a really crappy winter that they've spent here. When you think about yeah, it, it goes to half. I mean, that's like Black Plague numbers, you know. Anyway, so, anyway, can we, can we can we move to a brighter spot here? Yeah, if you want. Something happens now. There's been some tense encounters. Maybe we should we exchange shots on the class, <coughs> right? But then, the, but then somebody strolls into camp. Well, in the in the spring, out of the the tree line walks a Native American right into camp. And says, "Welcome, Englishman." And in English. In in English, yeah. And that's to me. To me, this is the most amazing part of the whole story, that the pilgrims settle in a place, and and like just by co some miraculous coincidence, some guy shows up that knows English. Hey, hey, dudes, what's up? And he's an Indian. Yeah, his name was Somerset. He was an Abenaki Sagamore, which means he was kind of a sub chief. The uh, Abenaki not really being from that area, they're, they're more native to the main area, but apparently he was a dignitary, maybe dealing with uh, Massasoit from the Wampanoags, 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 and he strolls right into camp and says, Welcome, Englishman. So, so you know, we have death, 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 death. <laughs> death, death, yes. Gloom and doom. So let's talk about the, something. The people, the, the people of the Mayflower have experienced right. nothing but, yeah. and probably everybody else too. Remember the village there died before. But I mean, let's just let's stop talking about. It. Let's talk about what now. The sun is coming out, leaves are budding, and this is the spring. <laughs> and something happens, which I find miraculous. Mm -hmm. That Greg's going to talk. Okay. <laughs> that that you was go. your softball? That's your softball, Greg. There you go. Yeah. Somerset. Come on, man. Something miraculous. Okay, Greg, so, get it. <laughs> so Somerset. It was uh, a miracle from God. Come on. Steps out of the woods. Steps wood. out of the woods and, and says, Welcome, Englishman. And then. Uh, uh, In English. Right. So then he he says he will return with uh, the chieftain of the local. Uh, are uh, Native Americans and some and his interpreter. He comes back a few days later with 60 warriors and, and the Wampanoag uh, Sachem Massasoit, which wasn't really his name. His his actual name is. Massas anyway, Massasoit is actually a title, not not his name. And uh, so he shows up with... Uh, Wait, what's Massasoit mean? It means, like, uh, chief. Cacique. Cacique. Big dog. No. Cacique. Cacique. <laughs> oh, God. 
So anyway, he, he comes, or a Massasoit in, in uh, to Squantum, who we know is Squanto. Uh-huh. You heard right. Squanto. <laughs> uh, come back with uh, Somerset. And along with 60 warriors, and the English say, "Come on into our village, and we'll we'll talk." The Indians want a uh, a hostage in return because they just Which don't feel is comfortable. perfectly understandable. Yeah, they're not going to come in unless they unless, unless somebody they from the village so that they can hold them outside of them. right. Okay, <clears throat> this is common common um, and so practice. The, the uh, English decide that Edward Winslow will be the uh, hostage, and apparently he's all right with that. And, and after this, he later becomes kind of the envoy between Massoid and the Pilgrims. Anyway, so they they have a little they have a little chat. Actually, actually kind of kind of bang out a treaty, a lot with the help of uh, to Squantum, who's the interpreter. Squanto, who speaks pretty fluent English, because he was actually uh, kidnapped by a slaver and sold to the Spanish and or went to Spain and and was uh, released by his Spanish monks got his release and he went to England and found his way back to New England on a ship as a as a uh, interpreter and guide with the English fishermen yeah. so he, he he came back and this this particular place was called Patuxet where the uh, uh, the pilgrims were now living and that was originally his home village and so uh his his family's gone the uh plague has killed them and it could it, why he was in captivity well, and, and this is this is how the the pilgrims who live there now that's how they found out about this plague that wiped the village out they found out from well what, actually, from this meeting with the indians right native americans excuse So anyway, I'm going to refer to him as Squanto from now on. Squanto! He uh, he decides to stay with the English colonists in their new uh, village of Plymouth, and he teaches them how to plant corn, how to plant squash and, and beans and everything next to the corn when it's coming up, all the little all the little tricks of the trade of how you perform uh, plant husbandry in the new world, which a lot of their uh, seeds and everything that they brought with them wouldn't work in this in the in the soil. And uh, Squanto basically saves the day. And that part of the whole narrative is as far as we know, the absolute truth. Yeah, it's pretty close to being. They were they were saved by the Native Americans. That's right. for sure. Well, shortly after that, uh, after the the first meeting, the, the Mayflower goes, you know, pulls anchor and sails back to England, right, to get more supplies shortly and, and to inform them of their of their landing, et cetera, et cetera. So by you know, by uh, uh, November of sixteen twenty one. Now we're talking about. Now we've had a whole summer of time interacting with the right, Indians, and they've right? had a harvest and, and a harvest and all the and all the stuff that you know the the, the fish planted with the corn has has borne fruit, et cetera, et cetera. And so now we've got an actual functioning colony, but only fifty three are left. All the rest of them are dead, right? Five women, only four adult women, one child. So uh, here we go. First Thanksgiving. <laughs> well. There's from from the research I've done. There's several sources say that that Squanto's the one that suggests that hey they do a uh, do a harvest festival of Thanksgiving every year. This is Squanto I'm talking about. <laughs> this was first of all Thanksgiving wasn't called Thanksgiving no. until 1863. Even if it was called Thanksgiving in 1863 when Abraham Lincoln made it an, a, a federal holiday. Holiday. Well, it wasn't a federal holiday until 1941, wasn't right, it? Right, right, right. But, uh, but it wasn't called Thanksgiving, but we know, but we do know that there was a tradition in all through Europe, including England, of, of, of festival at the end of, after the harvest was collected. Right, which is just normal natural no, stuff. Right? Yeah, I mean, every... you got all the every, food coming in, you got to eat. Everybody has a, everybody has a harvest yeah. festival. Harvest... You know, in the, in uh, England, it was called Harv Harvest Home. 
you know everybody does it so the fact that that people say that it was just a made-up story it wasn't a made-up story it was just different than what it was embossed in, in, into something that it actually wasn't but the fact is that the celebration did take place There's, there's also uh, a lot of the research I've done said uh, what one big difference as the in, was that the Indians weren't actually invited. <laughs> yeah. Well, they sort of invited themselves. They showed up with deer, right? I mean, well, they. they they provided deer. One of the things I came across in my research was that uh, apparently, and this kind of ex ex this might go out on a limb, but apparently they the Indians had heard the pilgrims celebrating with like a, a game such as uh, uh, like a turkey shoot or something like like that, uh -huh. and they're and they're you know popping off a lot of lot of rounds of ammunition, so they. Uh, Massasoit shows up with 90 warriors and then all of a sudden they realize that it's not you know nothing's really happening it's, it's just a a, it's just a celebration Big party right and and then they're they've got 90 90 guys there and they and the pilgrims are all having a party and they're like let's go out and get five deer and so we can go to the party so they show up with with five deer and become part of the whole celebration, and and, and, it's, and the uh, the understanding is that the, the pilgrims, but they they uh, sent out people with hunters, uh, hunting parties with fowling pieces, and they shot a bunch of birds, and theoretically we, we have turkeys, we have <laughs> you know, maybe sparrows, and there's, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of gunfire going on, and 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 the theory is that they they might have not actually invited invited the uh, Wampanoags to this celebration, but they showed up. Yeah, when they showed up, what are you going to do, so that's, right? I mean, that's the, that's the story, like the, the, like the first Thanksgiving thing was not necessarily a, it wasn't a planned. mutual party. Yeah, it was no, probably like wasn't planned. The Indians planned. showed up, and then, <coughs> and then, no. It ended up being a party. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we didn't, and they were like, oh, God, we didn't but, bring but anything. But anyway. The, so, so they turned, like, in any direction at that point, you could probably shoot a deer, like, in almost any direction. The notes, the notes, well, no, because they were wary of humans. But the notes say that this big party lasted for three days. Who, the Indians or the deer? No, the, the deer. Well, the deer. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Who's wary of humans? The Indians or the deer? The Indians are humans. Because these days the deer aren't. The the, na the native At indigenous in peoples are humans. I don't know what you're implying there. Oh, God. But the deer, <laughs> the deer would run away. As people were hurling firearm hot lead at them, etc. So anyway, they so they so everybody shows up and it is, it turns into a big three day celebration feast, man. Everybody eats, everybody's got food. So, but the, but you're serious. So there's a lot of stories about how like the Indians weren't necessarily invited. It wasn't necessarily yeah. That's party. one of the it wasn't a gathering. Yes, yeah, Greg's got that. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the uh, yeah. They don't you know they they don't necessarily think that they sent out an envoy to say hey. Hey, uh, you so, Wampanoags! Uh, we're gonna we're having a, we're throwing a big uh, party here on uh, in a in a week or so. Yeah, Why don't you guys show got, up? Yeah, because those corn you helped us grow and the things you helped us with are, are actually, right. And so and so, like, so which is, which you know which is you know I mean out of politeness, if uh, Massasoit probably would have only shown up with a handful of warriors to go to a party, but if he was planning on. Uh, Going to see if, that there might be some kind of uh, battle right. mischief to get into. He shows up with he shows up with ninety warriors. Yeah. Right. So this is so we're, we're, we're talking. So we're talking yeah. November, right? So it's harvest season. So let's speculate for a few seconds about the food. So we got we got turkeys, we got other birds of various varieties. Turkeys, like I don't know. Are you sure? Yeah. Well, it says uh, turkeys were native to that area, and they're. Pretty much, you know, they can't fly very well, so they're pretty much more of a sitting duck type of a beast. But I'm not, I'm not 100 uh, percent sure what other sorts of things they had. Were there ducks? Maybe. I'm <laughs> sure there probably were ducks. Well, there was, but they, but they went out and shot birds. The, the the colonists shot birds, pheasant, and maybe, and, and they. But for sure, they also went and got fish. 
Yeah, lobster. Yeah, I mean, lots of fish. I lobster, lobster. Lobster just probably throwing themselves oh, in the. I, I haven't seen anything that said for sure that there was lobster that they got, but they but they for sure got like fish, which until way later. Okay, well let's talk about what they didn't have. They didn't have pigs, right? They didn't have chickens, right? They didn't have beef cows. They didn't have marshmallows to put on the sweet potatoes. They didn't have sweet potatoes or marshmallows. All right. They didn't have green bean. Cas- they didn't have green bean casserole. They didn't have, they didn't have any sugar with them at all. Right, probably no sugar, which means what? No cranberry sauce. Pro- maybe cranberries though, because there's cranberries yeah. up there. Or mashed potatoes. No, no, yeah. there's no potatoes at all. Mashed potatoes are just potatoes corn that are mashed. <laughs> corn, corn and venison is probably your big corn venison and corn. They. Corn. Uh, what about roots like root vegetables? Probably root vegetables, right? Like. Well, parsnips and stuff like that. Uh, apparently, we're the Vega. Uh, apparently the pilgrims are, were really, for some strange reason, were really into uh, growing arugula. Really? Yeah, but but that but arugula is a spring plant, and we're talking November, so, well, so I don't we're know. Talking, I guess, uh, that's probably, probably like some bread, like from grain and some like cornbread. I maybe don't think I don't think they had a, I don't think they had a lot of flour to spare. I mean, I don't well, think clearly they, they all died of scurvy the winter before, so they don't have any fruit and vegetables, right? Well, so no arugula. They probably they probably had they probably had it by now. Do you think they had any kale? You're probably reading uh, uh, Guy Fieri's history of Thanksgiving dinners. <laughs> they had a genie Alfredo, and they had a great. There was a salsa. They had this plastic screw. They made, they made out of rocks. Yeah, they made a nice, uh, nice, nice salsa out of. Uh, some sort of gourd. Anyway, I, let's get to. Uh, um, everyone's on really good terms now. I mean, they're. Uh, uh, it's okay, we've had a good meal. Yeah, three and, days of good. And now yeah. everybody's pretty happy. And uh, in in the uh, the pilgrims and the Wampanoag are <coughs> allies now. The Wampanoag was hit hard by the plague of 1617. Some of their, some of the other uh, nations around there, such as Narragansett, which were their, which were their main uh, rival, weren't hit by this plague as badly as the Wampanoag. This plague apparently went from Maine, let a, did a 15 mile swath all the way down to Massachusetts, and uh, there were certain tribes that were barely touched. Some tribes were decimated. So anyway, the Wampanoag needed. Allies, Massasoit wants to incorporate the Pilgrims into uh, uh, being an ally because they've they've lost from fifty to ninety percent of their population from that that plague. Okay. And the Narragansett Just nation, like the, the Nar- Narragansett nation, has apparently barely been touched, and uh, so which which kind of tips the balance of power into the Narragansett's favor. So the uh, Massasoit figures he saw something that he thought he would want to keep them as an ally because they have all these cool weapons and everything and they might come handy against the people he's really worried about like the Narragansett and the the Massachusetts and uh, maybe the Pequot. Okay, are you going to are you going to go into the first the first war party? The Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where I was headed. Okay, okay. So so anyway, they uh, eventually. They have they have a treaty now. Uh, they're allies, but there there was something that happened between uh, Squanto. Squanto. And uh, Squanto, in Massasoit's eyes, was just getting a little too chummy with the English, and he wasn't sure that he was being told the truth by Squanto and all. All the uh, all all their talks and everything, and uh, there was a time when uh, Massasoit wanted the Pilgrims to give Squanto up to him. That's how pissed off he was, and they wouldn't do it. So, so anyway, Massasoit apparently got uh, gravely ill, and uh, Edward Winslow, who who had become kind of an envoy, uh, went to visit Mass or Massasoit. And I don't think he really knew that he was sick before he left, but when he got there, he 
kind of hung by him and uh, whether he whether he did anything medically for him or not, he was there when Massasoit recovered and they thought it was such a good omen, Winslow being there. So they, uh, uh, Mass- Massasoit confided that there was actually, um, the Massachusetts tribe was planning an attack on, on Plymouth and the, uh, was was Wessagusset? Wessagusset. Wessagusset uh, colonies. And uh, so that's, or Winslow went back to uh, Plymouth and as a preemptive measure, uh, the captain of the, of the militia, Miles Standish, Miles Standish um, they decided to do a preemptive strike on the Massachusetts. So they they go to Wessagusset and invite the uh, uh, Massachusetts Indians there to uh, sit down. And uh, when they show up, they kill seven of the Massachusetts and uh, behead one and take it back to Plymouth. And it was displayed in in the middle in the town square for years. That's kind of where the the Pilgrims. Well, he he's from what I understand, he he used a deception to get people to get two of their leaders get the gravis on him and then he killed them and uh, it wasn't fair no it wasn't fair and 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 that the word of that spread all across uh, the area and then everyone sort of is not so happy with the yeah but at the same time it also uh, scared him a little bit because they realized how ruthless the English could be. True, true, true. But it, but it, up until that point, up until this point, this is 1722, 20, 22, 23, something like that. 1723. Um, up until that 16, point. 1623, I'm sorry. We're, we're talking about six, from 1621 up until that point for two years. It's all pretty much a love fest between. The, uh, I mean, not a love fest, but mutual respect between the two the parties right. involved here. And then, uh, then this happened, and, and Miles Standish was responsible for some of that because he did he entered into to negotiations with tribes for to, to establish certain uh, things, and they paid back the, in, the that corn that was stolen that when they first got to the Cape Cod, corn, they paid that back. Man, right, they paid that yeah, back stole, and yeah. did a negotiation because those, those Indians happened to have a captive. <laughs> So anyway, the, the point is, the give and take, the negotiation, they respected that. And then suddenly, uh, there's this, there's this uh, deceptive act and the slaying of these people, and, and uh, that didn't bode well. Okay, well, well wait a minute. It's kind but, of a... But, it's... But, you're, but weren't you saying that Miles Standish, but he did this as a preemptive attack because he had heard... The, 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 the who, Massachusetts. The Massachusetts were going to attack the, the, right. the Plymouth Colony. Yeah, well, but he did. At the same time, he didn't. I don't. He he didn't do. You know, he he started it. He. I mean, he he. They actually tricked two of their leaders and murdered them, yeah, yeah. and then and then displayed a head. Yeah. Head in the middle of Plymouth. You know. Yeah. This uh, is the, this is something that you do in Europe to intimidate the you know to intimidate the rebellious peasants. The 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 ethic. Was different in the in the new world. The, the the sort of savagery that you might that you might expect out of your standard European. So, so the the ethic in that area, by luring the people in and killing them, and being so ruthless and displaying heads, that really alienated the local population, who had bef- by all accounts had before really respected the new colony because they they sort of were playing by the rules. So, so anyway, we're going to talk about more more in depth about all these issues well, later I, I, on. I was just trying to clear up the but issue. The whole, they, were, they were protecting themselves. And quite frankly, I didn't want to end on quite such a dark note. Well, because I wanted to talk about happy eating deers and celebrating with the Wampanoag and Massasoit and Squanto. Well, we did that, didn't and we? the joyful. Yeah. yeah, but then we ended up with Miles Standish slaughtering. Oh well, putting oh, well. heads on pikes and stuff. That's how the story went. That's, that's, that's how, how the story goes. That's how the right? news goes. <laughs> so I guess that's foreshadowing for the rest of our right. You know, this is kind of a micro. This here. was kind of a microcosm of what's in store for uh, for the for the next two hundred years or so. Mm-hmm.